hello, I'm Cheryl Meyer, and this, and I'm otherwise known as Cheryl M. Healthviews. And what my goal is, is to inspire you to lead a healthier lives. So when I proposed my podcast, I proposed that we present it in two different segments. The first one is It Feels Good to Feel Good, Future Proof Your Health, where I get to share everything I have learned to return my health back to relative wellness and to live a pain-free life in spite of the fact that I have autoimmune disease. But the second part of my podcast is this episode, and that's Tell Me Your Story, The Health Views Is In. My concept for this is it's all fine and well that you hear me tell my story, but I get a lot of it's all fine and well that it worked for you, but it's not going to work for me. And I wanted you to hear that there are lots of people out there that have made changes in their lifestyle that have supported their health and brought them back to relative wellness. We all have a couple things in common. We all owned our own health. Whatever the doctor was suggesting we did was going on on a parallel path to us making these lifestyle changes where we did things that cleaned up our toxic load. We all pay attention to our body. You'll hear jazz in the background because I want you to listen to the rhythm of your health and I want you to pay attention to what your body is telling you. My body had been trying to tell me that I was gonna topple over into toxic load for some time. I just wasn't listening. So if you clean up your lifestyle, and if you listen to your body, you have a very good chance, not of being deprived in any way, but returning to feeling darn good. And that's what these podcasts are really all about. So thank you for joining me. This is gonna be a Tell Me Your Story, The Health Needs Is In episode, and I hope you enjoy it. And I hope that we all inspire you to lead a healthier, happier life. Thank you. Welcome to another edition of Tell Me Your Story. We have a wonderful guest today who was struggling with sleep apnea, which is something we have not talked about on here, but I have a husband with sleep apnea and I know how harmful it is to your health and how difficult it is to get under control. So I'm delighted to bring David Summerfleck on today to talk about how he had sleep apnea, it was misdiagnosed for a long time, and it was interrupting his life. He was an A-type personality, I think, it doesn't say that in his bio, but he was a high achiever, and he was a digital marketing executive with 20 years of experience of marketing and advertising agencies across the globe. And he started two businesses and trained in political campaign messaging by the White House Project, which is also interesting. He taught journalism and English at several colleges and universities, and he is a certified small um, business mentor for over 10 years. And he's written um, one book and has one on its way out. The book that he's written is The, yep. Ro the Road to Digital Marketing Profits. And then the new book, which I'm going to want to hear about because I don't know what it's about from the title, is The Band of the Hand. Yes. So welcome, David. I'm delighted to have you here. Thank you so much for having me, uh, Cheryl. I, I appreciate your time. And for anybody watching or listening, I appreciate your time as well. So where do you want to start? You want to start with what your background in education and, and how you began to have some kind of problem that was interrupting you? Sure. Well, basically, you know, I worked for marketing and ad agencies, as you alluded to, for a long time, a very long time, really. And as I got to be a little bit older, I mean, um, I this probably started maybe 25, 30 years ago is when I really started to feel it. Um, you know, I, I would be at a red light and just start to just uh, start to nod off. And I'd be in meetings and I would have to shake my leg. 
uh, you know, maybe rub my hands together. Uh, I was, you know, drink, you know, maybe two or three energy drinks uh, per per day to keep myself uh, going, and that's it's, it's difficult. And um, you know, I suspected something was going on because I was just always tired all the time, and I felt well, maybe I just don't get a good night's sleep. I don't know. And so at one point, I don't remember the dates because this has been going on for so long. And um, so there was at one point where I had decent benefits. They weren't good. They certainly weren't great, but they in, covered me going to the doctor and, and inquiring into a sleep study. So I went to one doctor and described what was happening and said, you know, could I get a sleep study? My benefits say that they will pay for it. Uh, because without the benefits, I think it was extremely expensive. And uh, you actually have to spend the night in the clinic. Yeah. Well, they have different types of sleep studies for sleep apnea. So at this time, my benefits, remember, were not that great. So I had one that they, they mailed, uh, they had delivered to you, and it was a band that would go around your, your waist or your chest in different bands. There was a finger um, a appliance or device that would go on your finger to measure your pulse rate. And you would wear that overnight at home. Now, I was told that that wasn't 100% accurate. It would only reveal some information. But at the time, that's all my benefits would cover. So I did that. So they said, yeah, you do have pretty bad sleep apnea. We don't really know what to do because it's, does, it, it's only a part of the picture. So then I think it was a year later, maybe six months later, I went to a different doctor, had an, um, another sleep study done. And this was one where I went into a laboratory. It was basically like a hotel room and you'd lay down and try to sleep. And it was a very horrific uh, experience because I remember laying down and having all the tubes hooked up to me, all the different electrodes on my head and my cheeks and so on. And I remember the nurse saying, lay down, go to sleep. And I said, I, I can't just push a button and go to sleep. She said, no, lay down, go to sleep, be quiet. And um, there was some to, yeah, different, uh, the, it, she came in and then put something under my nose, the, um, the nasal cushion mask is what it was called. And she put that under my nose. And I felt like I was gagging. And I said, you've got to take this off of my face. I feel like I'm drowning. I can't get any air. I can't handle this. And she said, calm down, lay down. I couldn't. Um, and I might have fallen asleep for maybe two or three hours. And I just remember her waking me up and saying, get dressed and get out of here. And I said, well, wait a minute. What about the results? What happened? I went into the lab and the night person who was there, there overnight said, you have severe sleep apnea. It's a miracle that you can walk and talk and, and chew gum. He said, it's a miracle. You should have had like five strokes or something by now. Yeah, yeah. Stop here and explain to everyone what the jeopardy is of having sleep apnea, because it, well, it impacts more than just the fact that you can't stay awake. Right, right. It does. It, it's, it's a miracle that I was doing what I was doing, because bear in mind, during all of this, I was working full time. I was also working part time. So am I working a full time job that requires a good deal of mental con uh, concentration? You know, I'm coming up with marketing plans for very large corporations and enterprise level agencies and, and looking at metrics and so on. And then in my spare time, I'm teaching workshops and boot camps to make more money so I can pay the rent. And this was going on for at least 20 odd years. Um, so what, what Wait, he told stop one second. If you have sleep apnea, you can have a heart attack. You yeah, can have a stroke. Yeah. Um, 
it can send um, like an aneurysm to your brain. Yes. It has really dire problems if you don't take it on. Yes. Like a like hold on to the bull. Horns yes. because it's yeah. it's severe and if you Abs had severe sleep apnea thank god you found out that that's what was going on absolutely well i had it for at least 20 years that i know about and uh, so anyway at that particular time he said yeah you have severe sleep apnea his exact words were for you sleeping is like vietnam and i said well gee thanks that doesn't really help me what do i do and I remember him saying, well, your benefits don't cover you getting a CPAP. No, he said, your benefits cover you getting a CPAP machine, but it does not cover you getting anyone to show you how to use it or how to set it. And it doesn't cover you getting any type of face, facial covering so that you will get the oxygen. You're going to have to figure that stuff out for yourself. So, of course, I didn't know what to do. I was working full time. I was working part time on weekends and in evenings, teaching these very elaborate, uh, in some cases, day long work shops and boot camps. So I was doing that for quite some period of time. And so I just said, well, I don't really know what to do with this. I, I, I don't even know where to begin. I'm just going to put it in a box and put it in the closet. And I'll, I, I've been able to do this for most of my life. I'll figure this out somehow, or it's just a joke told in poor taste, which is what it really was. Um, and then a couple of years later, I ended up working at a different, uh, better agency at a higher uh, level. And I had much better benefits. So I was finally able to see um, an, an ENT, an ear, nose, and throat specialist who basically looked at me again. I did another sleep study in another lab and this time saw an ENT and he said, look, everything makes perfect sense. He said, you have severe, severe sleep apnea. He said, you're having maybe 80 episodes per hour. He said, you know, that's beyond any, you know, beyond severe. It's, it's staggering. And, um, and he said, you know, before you can really get treatment, though, he's like, you've had your nose broken a couple of times, haven't you? I said, well, when I was in high school and college, I was athletic. I really wasn't very good at sports. So I would fall down and get hurt. You know, um, I took Aikido in college, and I loved it. But I wasn't, you know, Bruce Lee or anything by any means. So I probably had my nose broken more than one occasion. So he said, before we can treat the sleep apnea, we've got it. You got to do the surgery. We've got to straighten out those tubes in your nose, because even if you wear a mask, the air, the oxygen going into your nose, the tubing has to be straight. Otherwise, he said, he said that my nose was like the Amazon. And he said, we're going to have to straighten it out. And he said, at this point, he said, your benefits cover the machine, showing you how to use the machine, but not the surgery. So I said, okay, that's fine. Okay, you know what I did? I went to a different marketing agency, moved up a little bit more, finally got better benefits with them. And finally was able to go see an ENT surgeon uh, who had good reviews, um, who took my insurance, was able to get the surgery done, which was is a whole other story that I'm happy to talk about if you want me to. So that was a whole other experience. I had no idea what to expect. And they're completely, uh, what they said would happen didn't happen. And um, so once I had that done, then I was able to go to an ENT and the, um, to a sleep specialist, rather. That experience didn't go smoothly at all um, because I didn't know anything about it. I'm not a sleep uh, specialist. I'm not an ENT. I mean, that's not, I don't have a medical degree, so I don't know anything about it. I didn't know where to begin. So the first, uh, the first sleep specialist I went to said, well, you should wear a full face mask which for anyone not familiar with that is basically 
it's like a scuba diving mask that covers your entire face and it goes under your chin and well above your forehead and needs to be skin tight. So it's, it's quite difficult to sleep with it on. It was actually painful to wear because I was told that it has to be skin tight. I tried sleeping with that. My number of events per hour went from 80 to 70, which is good. It's better, but it's not. But it's still not good. Not at all. And um, I would wake up in the middle of the night and the mask would come off and slide into my mouth because I would snore. So it wasn't doing me very negligible. And I ended up getting very, very sick because I was getting really sweaty during the night from the mask on and all. Even the just keeping the masks clean. Yeah. is a whole right, exercise which is, unto itself, right? Right, and I can talk about that as well. You you guide the conversation. But um, so basically that wasn't working. And I kept going back to him saying, my, my number of events aren't going down. And he just said, well, I just don't know. I just don't know. Try a different full face mask. Try a different one. And so finally, after like a month or two of that, and the numbers were not going down, and I was getting sick, and then get recovering, and then getting a cold and then recovering. So after about going through that, like for about a month, finally, I just went back to that sleep specialist, and I was angry. And I said, I'm not getting any better. You don't seem to know what to do. You're not listening to me when I'm here, you keep looking at your watch nothing is improving. I need you to really do something. And, and I don't feel like you're hearing me. I want to try something else because it shouldn't be like this. And you can't sit here and tell me that that's okay. And he just said, well, I just don't know what to do. Let me have you talk to my assistant because I, I, I give up. And he got up and his assistant came in and his assistant pretty much said the same thing. He said, all we can do is just have you keep trying other full face masks. And I said, well, how about if you just try one of those half masks, the tubes that go under your nose, and then going around? What's that called? He said, well, that's called a nasal cushion mask. And he said, but I don't know if that'll help you or not. And I said, well, what, what do you got to lose? Do you have one that I could have? And he said, well, let me look and try to get one that's measured for your face because you're a pretty tall guy. You're tall and skinny. Let me see if I have one for you. And I said, that would be great. And I'll, let's just try it. So we literally tossed it in my lap. And I took it and I left. And I told my wife, I said, I'm not going back to him ever again. But I went home and I tried it. And the numbers started to go down. And I called him back. And I said, well, the numbers are starting to go down. What should I do to make it go down more? And he said, well, try putting Band-Aids over your mouth or something like that to keep your mouth shut. And I said, I'm not a hostage or something. What are you talking about? And so I just did a lot of reading on my own. And I learned about using a Velcro chin strap. And I learned to do trial and error how to position it so that my mouth would not open. When, it, when you relax and you fall asleep, your mouth will open. And if you snore with your mouth open, a full face mask would not help you. I didn't know that. I expected the sleep specialist to know that. Right. He, did, he didn't know it. Uh, so the what was happening was my mouth would open because I'd fall asleep and I would snore negating any benefit that you would get from the full face mask because well, the mask is mouth. supposed to keep you from snoring altogether right so it, it did no good whatsoever and um so i learned from reading and from different forums hey you need a chin strap band-aids are stupid they're not going to help you that's ridiculous so i got on amazon ordered a couple of chin straps tried different ones until i found how to wear it so that it wouldn't hurt, but it was firm enough to basically keep your mouth from opening during sleep. And I used how to, I learned how to use the nasal cushion. Now, then I went to a different sleep specialist 
who had much better reviews, who was across the street from a major hospital in the area. He was different too. He had a different personality. He liked to tell jokes. That was very awkward. Um, but he knew what he was doing. And he just said, you've got to always wear this, this type of mask. Let me get you to come in for a uh, full night sleep study so I can see how this really is working with this nasal cushion because no one ever has and they haven't done it like this to see what will work and what won't with you on this machine with this let's sit down and show you how to use the machine and really start to solve this and so I did that and that was maybe a year year and a half ago wow and I remember the first night that I tried it, I felt like a gorilla was sitting on my chest and like I was choking or like somebody was strangling me underwater. That's how it felt. And I was, that's how I literally felt. And I just said, okay, everything else, everything intellectually is telling me that this should work. So you need to relax and let this machine do its, its business. Um, so I just started listening to meditations, uh, you know, with an iPod or an MP3 player or headphones like, like what I'm wearing. And that would relax me. And since then, I've noticed, if I breathe deeply, the score will be higher. If I just try to relax to my utmost, it is, this is just a regular, normal activity. Just lay down because you're tired. Listen to an audio book, listen to C-SPAN, listen to some boring podcast or something fun. And I would fall asleep and my score is always lower. And I noticed about maybe once a month or maybe more, I'd say more than that, maybe once every two or three weeks, if I exercise and have a really, really good strenuous workout, I am really sore, like I've been run over by a train, your score is much better. Because then your, uh, your body is tired, you're much more relaxed, so that the machine just gives you regular breathing, you're not breathing in deeply, it doesn't feel like there's a give and take or back and forth or any resistance. So I learned a tremendous amount about sleep apnea from all the trial and error of going to different doctors, different ENTs, uh, and not every ENT is a, is a surgeon. Uh, not every sleep specialist is an ENT, believe it or not. So it's really important to see only ENTs, only sleep specialists who are ENTs, who know what they're doing. So after all these experiences I had, I realized you, I, I'm not seeing someone unless they are an ENT who is an ENT surgeon and an expert in sleep medicine. So were, that's what Were I there other signs that the sleep apnea was impacting your body? Did you have high blood pressure? Um, yeah. Not that I'm aware of with high blood pressure. Okay. But I would very, very easily fall asleep. Uh, like I said, during meetings, if I stopped at a red light and I wasn't cognizant of this fact, I'm at a red light, I could fall asleep. You need to play some loud music. You need to uh, put the windows down, get as much air rushing in as possible. Um, if it's a long you know, cross country trip, Every two hours or so, you better pull over and go, you know, walk around. Um, so, yeah, from working, you know, you don't want to fall asleep while you're talking to somebody or you're in some kind of an important meeting. It doesn't look very good. Um, you know, if you're working on a project at your PC, obviously you don't want to fall asleep. You want to stay uh, plugged into what you're doing. So I had to learn to adjust to those things. Uh, those situations. So to my knowledge, I don't think I had high blood pressure. I could have, I don't know. And, and to be honest with you, no ENT ever checked it that I'm That's aware amazing of. amazing to me. They didn't care. 
they they didn't care. They didn't they didn't check it. Well, that's not fair to say. Uh, they would check my blood pressure when I went into the office at first. That's not because I'm patching this together through my memory. But I didn't check my blood pressure on my of my own volition. But I remember going in and they would check my blood pressure and say it might be a little bit higher than normal. But it was never anything that was of grave concern. Right. But it was a little bit higher than normal. And, and did they um, check your heart? Did you do a stress test? No. No, it's, nothing like getting on a treadmill right. or nothing like that. Just, you know, let's, let's check your pulse, check your weight, and then talk to you for a few minutes. Interesting. Yeah. So everything I know about uh, sleep apnea, I learned through trial and error or from reading online. So somewhere in that sleep apnea journey is probably a book somewhere. You know, if I were to piece everything together in chronological order with the specific dates and, you know, uh, looking back over the documentation that different doctors said, you know, obviously without naming names, I could probably write a book about it. And it, and it might be beneficial to people going through this. But the most common questions I see on Facebook and Reddit and Quora relating to sleep apnea are basically people suffering at the beginning phases. What do I do about this mask that isn't comfortable? What do I do uh, about getting proper diagnosis? I have doctors telling me one thing, but I'm experiencing something different. For the most part, they don't tell you. Empathy isn't required. And, <laughs> that is um, not a requirement for a medical doctor. It helps yeah, when you have it, one who is. But it should be. And um, when I had uh, the the nose surgery, and it's not nose surgery. It's um, what's the term to a uh, septoplasty to correct the innards of your nose. I went to go see the ENT. It was very nice, but. He told me, well, I remember the after before the surgery, well, how does this go? How does recovery go? And he said, well, after the surgery, give it a day and you should be fine. You should be ready to exercise again, go for a jog around the block if you want to, uh, what have you, but you can't go swimming for at least a month. So I said, okay, you know, he has good credentials. He seems like a nice person. He seems to be well informed. I don't see any negative reviews. I checked him, uh, you know, through the state uh, medical examiners and so on. And um, he was completely wrong. So after the surgery, I was bleeding like a stuck pig. Uh, my nose was like a leaky faucet. It bled nonstop for about three days. Um, I couldn't breathe through my nose for at least three days. Um, after three days, and I was very scared because you don't know, is this a, a botched surgery? Um, you know, is this going to get better? Because he said one day. So it bled nonstop for three days and I couldn't breathe through my nose at all. And after the third day. And you certainly and, weren't going to go exercise that way. <laughs> well, actually, actually, what I did was after the third day, I was really upset. And I just said, if this is my new life, I'm not going to accept it willy nilly. I'm going to turn this around. And I started doing push ups and sit ups and just saying to hell with this. And I started doing push ups and sit ups and I got really sweaty. I took a long, long, super hot shower. And um, there was an opening like the size of a pin that opened up in one of my nostrils and I could start breathing through it. And I said, that's it. That's finally, you know, the, the sun is coming through the sky, you know, through the clouds. And so I kept doing that. I kept exercising until I was you know, sweaty. And then I would go take a really long, hot, hot shower as, as hot as I could stand for as long as we had the hot water until the hot water would run out. 
And, and after I'd say about another three days or so after that, they would just, and I don't want to gross people out, but after about another three days, there would just be huge gelatinous scabs just coming out like, you know, like parts, like a red jellyfish would just be parts of this gunk coming out of my nose. And then like a couple of days later, I could start to breathe through it again. And it would still bleed uh, intermittently. So it actually took several weeks for it to really stop bleeding. And when I went back to the ENT, just said, oh, yeah, we expected this. And this is no big surprise. And kind of played it down, which I expected him to do. And I just said, well, can you look inside? Is everything healing correctly? Does it look all right? He said, everything looks fine. It's a little bit inflamed, uh, but that's to be expected. And it made logical sense. And so I can breathe through my nose. And, um, and, that, and, and I think he said, you have to wait a month after that he would tell you when you could begin, you know, using the CPAP machine and the nasal cushion. Cause he said, obviously you don't want to use it when your nose is still bleeding from the surgery or still swollen. So I think it was, it might've been a month, maybe two months after the surgery before I could try the nasal cushion mask and begin, you know, wearing that. And the first night, it was very scary. Like I said, I felt like somebody was choking me underwater. And, you know, I realized just listen to meditations or podcasts or something like that and just give into it. Just relax and know that the machine knows what it's doing, if that makes sense. And after like the third or fourth night, I woke up and I just felt so full of energy. Because you finally slept. Yeah, I felt very, very full of energy. I felt uh, very clear, very clear minded. I felt very creative. I felt uh, very alert. You know, I felt like I had more energy than, than I'd ever had before. And so now I know, I mean, if you give yourself uh, 10 hours of sleep, you're going to feel like Superman when you wake up. Because the reality is that even though I'm still, even though now I have the sleep apnea treatment, I have the proper fitting mask and all that's been done. The reality is that you still have, it's not a guarantee that you will have completely uninterrupted sleep. It's not like you lay down and you're like a, a corpse and you don't wake up during the night. So I still wake up two or three times a night but I don't wake up every 10 minutes like I was doing before. And can so, you go back to sleep after you wake up? Yes. That's then, huge. Right. And now sometimes it may take an hour. Sometimes it may take a few minutes. But yeah, before I would wake up about every 10 minutes and I would get up in the middle of the night. I would just get up and do things. And you just accept it as your, this is just a way of life. This is just, the way that it is for you. And that was the There's case a for new a long study time. that came out last year by a group of researchers from UC Berkeley. And they published a book called Why We Sleep. Yeah. And he talks at length about how important it is to get at least seven hours of uninterrupted sleep. Right. Because that last hour is when your brain sweeps the plaque out that would eventually give you dementia. And yeah. I, 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 have a, I get six hours of sleep really easily. I struggle to get that last hour of sleep, but he convinced me that I need to make a more concerted effort to do that. Right, listen to audiobooks, listen to meditations. Uh, that's my advice for people. Get a good, you know, um, MP3 player or uh, whatever, you know, you prefer. Um, I tried the wireless headphones for a while when I would sleep, but I found that with all the CPAP gear and the head uh, wiring and, and tubing and everything, it was, it just wasn't tenable. It wasn't realistic. So I finally have a, a MP3 players 
with very uh, long uh, earpieces. And I'll just listen to a business podcast or I'll listen to a language podcast or uh, something that's entertaining or some, you know, a silly uh, celebrity interview or something that isn't serious or it doesn't require that. Because sometimes I'll listen to a business podcast and I'll say, oh, you know what? I wish I had my notepad. So, uh, I'd so love it's to not letting you sleep. It's, it's yeah. energizing you to do different things. Right. So business audio books are really good. Uh, meditations are good. There are a lot of good people on YouTube that have free meditations you can download. Obviously, Amazon and eBay, you can buy all kinds of meditations. Uh, uh, Audible is great. And you just listen to audiobooks and meditations or lectures or talks or whatever. I love the great courses. And uh, they have an app on your phone where you can download lectures and listen to the great courses while you lay in bed. So it's, it's, it's wonderful. So I listen to that. And now the, the challenge is, there's so much I want to do. So the challenge is to go to bed at a reasonable hour, and then not get up early and say, Oh, oh man, I want to go be on this podcast, or I want to go help this client, or try to do something else. No, give yourself you said uh, how many hours per night? Seven is the minimum. You seven must is get the minimum. seven hours, right? And I can't help but wonder how many people do that in today's society, which is so uh, driven, so performance based. It just grinds people up. Um, so I, I try to make sure that you know, if you if you think you're going to get a good night's sleep give yourself two hours more than what you think. Because if I go to sleep at, let's say midnight, and I get up around nine, well, how many hours of quality sleep have you really had? I'll usually wake up in the middle of the night. I may, it may take me an hour to go back to sleep. Did I really have REM sleep in which you, you dream and, and so on? Well, I don't know. But if you, if you give yourself 10 hours of sleep, if you can, then the odds are much greater that you'll have REM sleep, that you'll have dreaming, uh, as you said, you know, that your, your body and your mind can, can deprogram and kind of calm down from all the stress. I mean, we live in a very, very stressful world. And if you compare US American culture to culture in other countries, it can be very different. I know in Japan, the suicide rate is very high because they take business so deadly seriously. Uh, it's so performance oriented. And certainly in the US, we don't even have the national healthcare system that they have in Japan or in every other country. So your level of healthcare quality is dependent upon how much you earn. And so, I mean, it's, it's a very... Um, chew you up, spit you out type of culture that eats its young. So we really got to take care of ourselves and each yeah. other, especially now. We have now. to own our own health. Yeah, uh, especially okay. now. It's vitally important because you have COVID running roughshod through the U.S. Half the country believes it's real and is trying to do what they think is right. The other half still believes it's a, it's a conspiracy or some nonsense. Um some people are trying to wear masks and some people are not. Some people are wearing them correctly. Some of them aren't. We don't know what COVID will do to you long term. And it, but, it, it's changing you know, as we go. It's not even yeah, the COVID that it was last January. Right. It's mutating because so many people are running around getting it. So it's mutating because it, the COVID is like, Look at all these people I have to go and infect. This is great. I'm going to change and get stronger. I'm going to try this approach. I'm going to see if I can infect other people. It's not as though COVID is intelligent. It's not. It's a virus. But it changes and mutates because so many people are getting it. It, it can't help. So how do you beat it? If everybody wore a mask, it would be over within a month. But they just won't do it.
I know. I actually wrote a blog on how to, you, we all need to change how we're dealing with our health because yeah. this is not the last super virus. And the functional community, which is what I follow, thinks that 88% yeah. of us are immune compromised with something. And yeah. it's because of how we eat. We are not eating nutrients to help our body build our immunity. We're eating synthetic ingredients that are toxic and we're eating fast food, which has no um, food value at all. So if we would change how we eat and if we would start to eliminate toxins, our bodies can build up a stronger immunity so that the virus, when it comes calling, doesn't stay very long or doesn't have any impact at all. So right. that's, that's what, what we, we need to do. But in the meantime, we have not done that. That's why our healthcare yeah. system is broken too. Everybody's right. sick it, because we're not taking care of ourselves. Right. And it would, yeah. And um, on a related note, I would love to see a podcast that maybe you can do an episode on um, diets in other countries and how well, I can't do it on other countries, but I sure have done several on how to eat properly here. Yeah, and I'd love it to means see that, that you swim upstream a little bit. My first book is about eliminating toxins. My second book is okay, this is great, but I live in community. How do I live with other people when they don't eat like me? They're still eating fast food and they're still eating in restaurants where they're getting their food in baggies and zapping it in a microwave. Whereas yeah, I only food. eat real food now and I try to eat 75% of what goes into my body is plant-based. Yeah, um, I, remember, I remember reading that in Ecuador, which of course has a national healthcare program. I read that in their constitution, uh, artificial GMO genetically modified foods are not permitted. Thank goodness. France so, doesn't allow them either. So but, I would love for you to do an episode where you talk to someone in Ecuador about that. Well, uh, France doesn't allow GMOs. There's a that's couple of places. Request. So yeah. I want to I want to okay. request that but, episode. I mean, from you. I have an episode about why you don't want to be putting GMOs into your body. Yeah. Because GMOs are one of two things. They have BT toxin in them, which grew up right in the plant, so that when the bug bites it, it blows up his little stomach and he dies before he does any damage to the plant. But unfortunately, BT toxin also blows up all our good gut bacteria. And when they originally came out with it, they said not to worry, it'll go into your stomach and your body will immediately expel it and you will be fine. Well, it actually is the gift that keeps on giving in your gut. It's growing in there. And in addition to being BT toxin, which is then going through your bloodstream and poisoning you, it's blocking all the good nutrients and minerals and vitamins from entering into your body. So it's like the double whammy. Now, the other kind of GMO is just as bad. It's called Roundup Ready. And Roundup mm. is glyphosate, which finally oh. lost a lawsuit. I think it's now two years ago. Robert F. Kennedy Jr. took on Monsanto and finally won. And now they've done, Bayer took it over and just had to do a multi-billion dollar payout to people who got cancer from Roundup. But they're still spraying Roundup on our crops. Yeah, they are. So, you can still buy it at Home Depot, I'm sure. For anybody who says, why should I eat organic? You really don't need those poisons on your food. So organic is the only way to go for two reasons. They're using the old agriculture method. So you're getting rotated crops and you're getting all the minerals and the goodness from the earth that you're supposed to be getting, like your grandparents or your great grandparents did. And you're not, they're using natural methods that are not toxic to grow your crops and they're worth it. And there's a new study out that they think that it's actually cheaper in the long run to grow organically than it is to do this big factory farming. Um, and it yeah. would save the earth and it would save the climate. There's all kinds of benefits to it. But the, for a long time, they kept saying, but it's more expensive, it's more expensive. The reality is our government pays for conventional farming and 
organic farmers have to pay all kinds of extra fees to get proven that they're organic. That's so right. the system's kind of backwards. I'm kind of glad that they have to prove that they're really making it organic because that protects me. But why does the other guy get, who's poisoning us get all the financial benefit? Our system is broken and it doesn't make sense. No, I, I agree with you 100%. So now let's go back to sleep apnea. Are sure. you're sleeping better now? Are you yes. um, staying awake more easily and functioning I better? I stayed awake this whole time. So um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, whereas before, if I tried to do this podcast interview with you before, it's entirely possible I could nod off. Um, you know, it's entire, it would be entirely possible that I could still, you know, fall asleep at, at a red light, which is not good. No, not when you're driving uh, the car. You don't want right. to be sleeping. Right. And so uh, I, I even had one time when I was driving where I started to go, oh, you know, I had to turn up the radio, turn the, you know, uh, put the windows down and everything. Uh, now it happened all the time. And uh, in Denver, it would get so cold that I'd actually roll down the windows and the cold would, you know, it was so cold. It would, you know, I didn't need to turn up the radio or anything. It was so freezing cold. That would give you um, a jolt, uh, you know. Uh, but yeah, absolutely. I'm much better now. And I'm very, very grateful for that. So you're more productive in your life. Absolutely. I wrote a book. I'm working on like two or three more. Uh, there's so many things I want to do. It's it's prioritizing them. And now you have the energy to do it. I want to ask you, yeah. what is Band of the Hand about? It's an interesting title. Well, my, my first book is called The Road to Digital Marketing Profits. The Band of the Hand is a book I'm working on that I don't want to give away everything, but I'll give away a little bit for you. Thank you. It's it's basically this concept that I learned a long time ago about how if you apply specific structure that's thought out beforehand, you can get a lot more done and accomplish much more with almost whatever it is that you do. And I started finding more and more of these processes and procedures that I'd learned from marketing agencies are almost always grouped in fives. And so I thought, what if I pulled together um, some of these top processes and procedures, and maybe if I did five processes and five of the top, top uh, procedures, put those together and then with an introduction of how I came to discover these processes and procedures and then go through them with lessons on how to apply them as well right. these principles that it could be really really helpful to struggling small business owners and nonprofit uh, founders and, and service providers and entrepreneurs and, you know, people working from home. Because uh, I know what they're going through. My heart goes out to them. I have enormous experience working with them. So it's just a question of uh, transitioning to where I'm writing more and not really uh, working with them as, as directly as I had before. Sounds good. Sounds like it's something that you have some passion to get done. I, I do. I love it. It's not enough time in the day. But that's a good place to be. I know I don't have enough time to do all the things I want to do either. But... Right. And, and, and now instead of drinking two or three energy drinks per day, I take one, maybe I drink a quarter of it in a typical day. Today, I had three podcast interviews spaced out during the day. So I drank maybe half of one. That's very different from drinking three at a minimum, just so you can function at work. Right. No, that's not good. A, a big difference. It's not good for your body. It's it, it, as well as for your life that, no. that you're depending upon those chemicals to keep you awake. Right. And I've also 
sworn them off. And I just said, you know, as soon as this uh, shelf that I have, as soon as the shelf is gone, I'm switching to Earl Grey tea or maybe some other type of tea. Um, but it's really important for anybody who thinks that they have a sleeping condition or a sleep issue to look for a qualified, experienced uh, ear, nose, and throat doctor, an ENT, who has also been a surgeon, who is also a sleep specialist, who has good reviews and references. How do you know? Go to Google, type in the name of the person, and you look up Google reviews. And this is just a little business tip. Every business owner should have reviews on Google reviews. Hello. So if a, if a, if an ENT doesn't have any reviews on Google reviews and or Yelp, I don't go, I don't take them seriously. If they don't have a professional online presence that looks professional, that looks like an agency made it, I do not go to them. Because if you're an ENT and you can't afford two or three thousand dollars for a professional website, I'm not going to trust you. So, and I'm not saying everybody has to adhere to that, but at the very least, good references on Google reviews. Everybody uses Google, everybody knows what it is. So they should have good positive reviews in Google reviews and Yelp. And, uh, you know, it, it should, they should look above board. They should look very professional and read the reviews. And if you see scary reviews, take them into consideration because sometimes the minority reviews that you don't think will happen to you do. Cause there was one ENT I went to, I went to so many, I, I, there's so much I probably left out of this interview that I just never put them all in order. I'd have to read through to you in chronological order, every experience I had. There was one ENT that I went to uh, because again, he was physically close to me and he had, for the most part, good reviews. The negative reviews basically said that he was always looking at his watch, always, um, you know, trying to bring in someone else, you know, every 10 seconds, get someone else in here so he could keep, you know, the machine going. And but I thought, you know what, most of the reviews are still good. And he's really close to me. And most of the views are positive. So I'll go maybe he can help. And I went to him and guess what happened? The negative review component turned out to be true. He may have been very experienced and very capable. But I'll never know. Because the whole time I was there, he kept looking at his watch, and his phone actually rang and he answered it. And I thought, first of all, how rude can you be? I'm a patient coming to you with a medical condition, trying to get your your professional experienced care for something that's very serious to me and your phone rings first of all it should be on mute or should be off or should be on silence he takes the call he took the call like 10 seconds after you started talking to me and he said i'll be right back and he left and then like five or ten minutes went by and one of the nurses came in and said you know you could get your stuff he's done and i said yes he is and i left I went right to the desk, made sure that my benefits covered everything. I made sure I got a receipt because I didn't trust them at that point. I left, went home and wrote, you know, a negative review and just said, this is what happened. I saw the doctor for maybe 10 seconds before he answered the phone. He left to take the call, didn't come back. So if I want to get, if I wanted to get proper treatment or let's forget about treatment, if I wanted to get proper diagnosis from him first to see what the issues were and then prescribe the treatment, he could have done it. So I'd have to go back two or three times before I could get him to do that. And I just thought, this is crazy. This isn't what I want. I want to go to one doctor who will sit down and talk to me and then say, okay, David, I've heard everything that you have to say. Here's what I think we should do, which I did get eventually. He was just one more of those ENTs that was not a good experience, but it was a good learning experience. Right. So, you know, so my point is read the reviews. And even if the reviews are predominantly positive and you feel really good, 
read the negative reviews too, because some of the negative reviews would turn out to be true. My, my wife was going to get a routine uh, procedure. What was it? A colonoscopy. So she was going to get a colonoscopy, which is a very routine procedure. And we read the reviews of this one doctor and he had like 99% positive reviews, only two or three negative reviews. And the negative review said that there was just something odd about him. They just didn't feel right, but they couldn't be sure what it was. So I said, oh, all, right, all right, I mean, what can you do with that? The majority of the reviews are very positive. He seems to have really good, you know, verifiable experience. Okay, I guess he's okay to go to. And then the next day I thought, hmm, let's look up his medical license in the database for our state and see if there's any, any pending lawsuits or suspensions or anything against him. And lo and behold, there was a single lawsuit pending again, uh, that had gone through the court. He was found guilty of, he uh, was found guilty and, and he owed something like $850,000 the person had passed away from getting a routine colonoscopy. I immediately told my wife, you're not going, sorry. You can be mad at me if you want to. Call and cancel this appointment immediately. Now, after you do that, come read this, come look at this. And uh, the interesting thing about that was the lawsuit uh, was coming up, it was like five years old. If two or three more months had passed, that lawsuit would not have been uh, registered in his background. So he was still allowed to practice. And uh, we would not have seen this legal action against him where he was found guilty and had to pay $850,000 in restitution. Who knows what happened to that? Well, actually, I do know what happened to the poor woman she basically became a vegetable. She uh, lost all feeling in her legs and was paralyzed and couldn't speak and couldn't breathe. I don't know what happened when she went in for a routine colonoscopy. I don't know how you get Sounds that. Sounds like the anesthesia. Yeah. So um, I just said, you don't need to go. I'd rather be awake and, and have Dr. Jellyfinger looking up my backside and actually um, I'd rather that you give me too little anesthesia than, than too much. So look at the reviews, read the reviews, read the negative reviews. And the doctor should have predominantly positive reviews that go back several years and then read the negative ones. And, you know, as far as sleep apnea, take it seriously. Um, I'd and, also and, recommend know. that everybody does a little bit of research on their own. Yeah. So that they have good, I like to say that everyone should have a robust conversation with their medical provider, which means Absolutely. they have to do some research on their own first. It doesn't mean that you don't respect that you're going to them because they're the authority or those who said of the greatest magnitude, but yeah. know what you're talking about when you go in there so that you get all your questions answered up front. And if the, you know, the average doctor's appointment is six minutes. So if they don't want to give you enough time to ask all your questions. You got at least a better shot of doing it if you've done some research ahead of time. Right, I, I always say, I, I tell the doctors from the beginning, I'm a slow talker. And if you don't like it, you need to book more time. You know, I need at least 15, 20 minutes of your time. I mean, they're getting very, they're being very well compensated for that time. Now, intellectually, we all know if they can bill four or five people per hour, they're going to make a year's salary or close to that. They're going to make very, very good income that way. Um, I remember the ENT who finally did my septoplasty uh, told me that he performed about six surgeries per day. And I said, well, how does that work out? I remember looking at the billing statement and he billed the insurance company around $30,000. So now imagine if he does six of those surgeries per day. That's, that's more than, that's probably triple what the average American earns in a year. Right. That he, I don't know he, how much he had to pay for the facility where right. he did the surgery and the nurses and the other people right. there and all that, but. Right, undoubtedly, 
undoubtedly there's overhead experience, uh, expenses, there's licensing and so on. It's unlikely that it would be $30,000 a day. So if, if he does six surgeries, he probably gets to pocket, I would think at least three or four of those per day. The least you can do is talk to the patient, try to put them at ease, address their concerns. It's not going to take an hour to do that. It just takes a few minutes of your time, a little bit of human kindness. And um, so for anybody with sleep issues out there, take it seriously. Go to Facebook and Reddit, uh, you know, research sleep apnea, go to the groups. Don't sign up for a group if it's not private. You know, don't use your real name. That should go without saying, especially, you know, on Facebook. Um, and if you store with your mouth open at night and you know that you do, I don't think a full face mask is the way to go because your mouth is going to be open all night long. I'm not an ENT. I don't know for sure. But ask about the differences between a full face mask and a uh, nasal cushion mask and which one is right for you and ask them to justify it and explain it. And if your uh, hourly numbers, how many apneas per hour you feel, if those numbers don't go down after you know a day or two, then go back and insist that they do something. Okay, great advice. Thank you. Really enjoyed talking to you. I Absolutely. appreciate you coming on my show. Well, for anybody watching or listening, I appreciate your time. And, you know, I hope that you can get uh, proper treatment to turn things around. It's made a big difference in your life. So if somebody's having the problem, I hope they'll take your advice and go get the situation, explore possibilities to take care of the situation. Yeah, so, worth okay. Thank you.